Arguing science versus religion could be like repeating one of Abbott and Costello's old routines, because religious extremists use a different lexicon than rational academics do. We're saying the same words, but with different meanings, and they're equivocating multiple meanings, all of which may be wrong. So we just talk past each other as if neither understands why the other doesn't get it. Now some of this is by design to maintain a misunderstanding necessary to preserve a pretend position. They don't want to know what it is because they want to believe what it isn't. Now, fundamentalists want a fundamental division and distinction between worldviews, where everything boils down to whether there's a God or not. That's their whole everything and they can't seem to get past that. They have a worldview where their myth of miraculous creation accounts for life, the universe, and everything, and they act as if there's only two sides to it, to believe in their Bible literally or to be opposed to it. In a false dichotomy where there are no other religions to consider and where every explanation must either be natural or mystical, they see evolution as a competing worldview, which, like their own, they think is supposed to encompass the origin of life, the universe, and everything. So the first and often biggest hurdle that I have to overcome when trying to explain evolution to creationists is getting over their stubbornly defended distortion of what evolution is and what it isn't. Darwin's book on the origin of species didn't mean an origin out of nothing. New species develop out of prior species. His explanation of evolution is a theory of biodiversity, meaning how a single basal population diversifies into two and then four, eight, sixteen, and so on, with some lineages thinning into extinction while others proliferate and dominate. That's where natural selection comes in. It's population mechanics acting on varying allele frequencies among reproductive populations, leading to usually subtle changes in the morphological or physiological composition of descendant subsets in a dynamic environment. When compiled over successive generations, these accumulated alterations can expand biodiversity when continuing variation between genetically isolated groups eventually lead to one or more descendant branches increasingly distinct from their ancestors or cousins. Or to put it much more simply and succinctly, we could summarize evolution as descent with inherent genetic modification. That means we're not talking about the evolution of planets that aren't alive or chemicals that don't have genetics. Evolution has absolutely nothing to do with the origin of the universe. If the Big Bang Theory were disproven tomorrow, evolution would still be a verifiably accurate and inescapable fact of population genetics. Likewise, it doesn't matter how life began, either. Even if we never found out what catalyst or conditions could have started those dominoes falling, the fact is they're still falling, and that is beyond dispute. But, as it turns out, we have learned quite a lot about that now. We still don't know everything, but it's not the mystery it used to be. Before evolution can begin, there has to be a genetic organism to evolve from. So the first organisms did not evolve out of living components. We're not talking about evolution now, instead we're talking about abiogenesis, an overlapping array of completely different chemical processes affecting or contributing to different stages of that development all the way from replicative polymers to recognizable cells. Abiogenesis differs from evolution is that there's no heritage, since most of the assembled modifications were acquired or absorbed horizontally across a broad swath of primordial components at a time when there was as yet no discernible ancestor-descendant relationships. We're not talking about lightning striking a mud puddle either, nothing so absurdly simple as that. The formation of primal organisms is at least as complex as the earliest forms of life itself. Of course, the earliest pioneers in science didn't understand any of that. They were very simple-minded and superstitious in the 1600s. They didn't even know about oxygen yet, so how could they have understood anything about biochemistry? Back then, even educated men commonly believed in vitalism, the idea that all life, plants, animals, everything, was animated by a sort of life force, and that when anything died, this evanescent essence of existence would emanate from it, causing fermentation and putrefaction, which is why any once living matter, such as organic refuse, old meat, feces, always smelled bad for a while, at least until all the vital force was completely evaporated. Because it wasn't just the physical mass that was rotting. They thought that the essence of the life once in it was going bad too. So they imagined that as this decaying, departing spirit ebbed out, that it would supernaturally re-solidify albeit in a diminished and degenerate form. They thought it would spontaneously generate mold, maggots, or mice. 
This was, of course, soon disproved in a series of experiments by a number of scientists, including Louis Pasteur, who used methodological naturalism to disprove a supernatural claim. Yet, he is incorrectly cited as having disproved abiogenesis. This leads to one of the most annoying misunderstandings of falsely associated terms, where every religious extremist thinks that abiogenesis is spontaneous generation, because even the dictionaries have these confused and will not make corrections even when you provide the proof. I know, because I've contacted a few of them myself with documents to show, but of course was ignored. So. I made a video explaining abiogenesis and another one describing spontaneous generation, both intended for middle school biology lessons. Uh, links in the description. Believers like to cite the law of biogenesis, which is the idea that life only comes from life, which they attribute to Louis Pasteur. But he got the idea from Rudolf Virchow, the father of cell biology. He was also the guy who first proposed abiogenesis in 1855, though that name was first coined by Thomas Huxley in 1870. Initially, Virchow said that all cells arise from other cells. He also said that all diseased cells must come from other diseased cells, but he had to admit that there had to be a first cell in each infected body that became diseased from a previously healthy cell. Thus, logically, there must also be a first living cell that came from what Virchow described as a prior matrix. The proposition being that genetic and metabolic cells must have developed through an intricate sequence of increasingly complex chemical constructs, each having been naturally enhanced by particular environmental and constituent conditions, which we now know quite a lot about. There has never been any natural law against this. Abiogenesis is the current, valid, and well-supported science of biochemistry, not the 19th century speculation of supernatural silliness that was spontaneous generation.